All right, welcome to an episode of Black Swan Revelations. My name is Shane, and in today's video, we are going to be reviewing two videos back to back. That's right, you are getting a double feature. We're going to be talking about the pre tribulation rapture theory, and then we're also going to talk about the mid tribulation rapture theory. So, in this video, this video is put out by Pure Flix with interviewed by Billy Hollowell, and he was interviewing author Jeff Hinley. So we're going to watch the first video. I'm going to share my thoughts as usual, and then we're going to jump into the mid-tribulation theory right after that. So you get two for one, so sit back, grab yourself some bubbly, grab yourself a cup of coffee, whatever it is that you like to drink while you're watching a video like this. And we'll get started. Just jump right in. Jeff Kinley, how are you today? I'm doing great, Billy. It's good to see you again, man. Well, it's good to see you. I appreciate you coming on today. We are going to be talking about some pretty heavy topics, uh, but in a way that's going to help people, I think, understand what scripture says, what the end times entails. And I have to say, you, Jeff, have written about a trillion books, and they're all amazing. A couple of them, Interview with, with the Antichrist, Wake the Bride, As It Was in the Days of Noah. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you've looked a lot at eschatology, at the end times. And so I'm going to start with a basic question, just so that our viewers can sort of understand, if they don't already, what is the rapture? If you could just take us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, basically, the rapture is the scriptural belief that Jesus Christ will return to the earth in the air to rescue his bride, the body of Christ, the church, prior to his unleashing his wrath on planet earth uh, during a time called the tribulation. That was a very good, that was a very good and concise um, definition. And that kind of brings... So here we go. That was like 30 seconds. Jeff Kinley lays it out. This is what the pre-tribulation rapture is all about. We get raptured before Jacob's trouble, before Daniel's 70th week, before the seven-year tribulation. If you, and we're, we're going to watch the next video after this one, but if you're to watch any video on post-tribulation, mid-trib, they usually run around in circles. It's weird. Sometimes even pre-rathers get mixed up in this, even though they're closer to pre-trib than they are post-trib, because both pre-trib and pre-rath, we believe that we're out of here. We get raptured up to heaven before God pours out his wrath. But when you watch videos with people that are trying to defend post-tribulation, a post-tribulation rapture, the first thing they usually do is they go on the attack and they attack pre-tribulation right out of the gate. That's usually what they do. And then they usually quote words in Greek, in Hebrew, and all this kind of stuff. And they say it's not in the Bible and all. They just attack, attack, attack instead of defending their position. So when you're watching these videos, especially when you're watching the pre-trib point of view, watch how effortless effortless it is for this gentleman to just present the theory of the pre-tribulation rapture. And then watch when we jump into the mid-tribulation of how difficult it is just to simply explain what they believe without attacking pre-tribulation. Because sometimes it's just nice to just, just let me know what you what you believe and then where you find it in the Bible and then let us figure it out. Instead of attack, 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 just tell us what you believe. It's okay, just tell us. All right, so let's just jump in here. Brings us into the tribulation, right? And mm -hmm. and just I know viewers, some of you are well versed in the end times, and some of you aren't. So we want to kind of start with these terms, and then we're going to move into an understanding of the pre-tribulation rapture. But before we get there, 
Um, you mentioned tribulation at the end of that. Can you just define the tribulation a little bit more so people understand? Yeah, the tribulation is known as the seven-year period at the end of, of the age where God uh, delivers his seal, trumpet, and bold judgments on planet Earth, while at the same time renewing his covenant and his promises to national Israel. So it's kind of a turning back to Israel, Romans 11, 25, 26. And then we see in Revelation uh, chapter 6 through 19, this uh, period of, of real apocalyptic wrath that God delivers on the planet. But it's a seven-year specific time. Uh, at the end of which Christ will return in the second coming. So you're, it's like you've done this before. You're so good at this. All right. So so that kind of brings us into this discussion, which you are well versed and you've written a lot on it. There is a debate in the Christian church. And really what's interesting is that the largest proportion of people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, um, at least based on the polling I've seen. And, and, and I'd agree with that. That's... <sighs> Here's here's one quick thing. You basically have three camps. You have pre, you have mid, and you have post-trib. Three camps. All three camps believe that we are exiting the earth. All three camps. So this is what we're talking about here. And the majority of Christians believe that we are raptured before the wrath of God commences on the earth. Post-tribbers have a tough time defending because what they believe is a rapture is not really a rapture. They call it more of a procession where we go up and then we go down and we actually help Jesus Christ find Jerusalem because he's been gone for 2,000 years. So that's what a post-tribulation belief is, is after everything is done, after the tribulation of those days, Jesus Christ comes down. But what they miss is they miss that there are people living in heaven. They skip over that. They skip over Jesus leading the charge on a white horse with his armies following behind him coming down. So instead they say, well, it's actually a procession. It's going up and down. We don't believe that we're going to heaven. We believe we're guiding Jesus back down like the disciples guided Jesus into Jerusalem. Like the ten virgins where five of them actually went out to the bridegroom and escorted the, the bridegroom into their home. That's what they'll say. It's after all this, after the wrath of God. Because we've got to understand there's seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. They all happen within a seven-year period. And we also have the Antichrist mixed in there. So, according to post-tribbers, they're like, this all has to happen on one day. What day is that? The last day. Because they love talking about that. The last day. That's when the resurrection happens. That's when Jesus hands out rewards. That's when we, we get raptured. We get resurrected. Armageddon takes place on that same day. Everything happens within that day. So pre-tribbers, man, it is so easy. It's like a breath of fresh air whenever you talk about a pre-tribulation rapture. It's so simple a child can understand it. So let's go back to the video. And when you look at what pastors believe, the largest you know percentage believe in this idea of a pre-trib rapture. So take us through what that means what is a pre-tribulation rapture i know there's a lot of pieces of that but but help us understand that yeah basically the idea of a pre pre means before so before tribulation rapture meaning the rapture happens before the tribulation and again it's the idea that, that god would rescue his bride before he pours out his wrath on planet earth of course we go through man's wrath right now and jesus said in john 16 33 you'll you will have tribulation in the world but not the tribulation that's going to come upon the whole earth, as Revelation 3.10 says. 
What so a lot of people in this discussion about the end times and and listen I think for most people they read the book of Revelation and they and it's confusing for them they they're trying to figure it out they're trying to understand it and you know they're trying to put these pieces together because prophecy is one of those challenging things where there are different parts of old and new testament scripture that you're piecing together to understand or to try to understand what's going to happen what do you think are some of the most compelling scriptures that back a pre-tribulation rapture? Well, I think one of them has to do with um, in John 14, Jesus Christ using this uh, Jewish wedding metaphor uh, promised his disciples that he would leave them, but then he would come back one day to take them to heaven. And the whole imagery of a, of a groom snatching up his bride, uh, taking her to heaven for a celebration. But then you get into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, which really kind of gives us the slow-mo version of the rapture itself. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, verse 10 tells us that we are delivered from the wrath that is coming. And of course, the context of 1 Thess and 2 Thessalonians really is the second coming, uh, excuse me, the, the end times. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says that we are not destined for God's end times wrath, but we are destined for salvation. The word salvation just means deliverance. Um, and then you've got, of course, Revelation 3.10, where Jesus promises the church that she'll be kept from the hour of testing that's coming upon the whole world like has never been before. So there's a distinction between being kept from something and being kept in something. It's kind of like when we went through uh, hurricanes down on the Gulf Coast and we lived down there, uh, we kind of rode out the hurricane. Uh, that's kind of like being kept in the hurricane, but some people fled the city and went north. They were kept from the hurricane. So I think God promises to keep us from the hurricane of his wrath uh, that's uh, coming in the end times. And then, Billy, I would just say also is when you look at the portrayal of the bride of Christ, of the church in Revelation, you have the word church mentioned about 22 times in the book of Revelation, 19 times it's mentioned in chapters one through three and a couple of times later than that. But during the time that the tribulation is portrayed, the church is not mentioned even once. In fact, she's portrayed as being in heaven during that time. So that's another reason why we would lean to the pre-tribulational rapture view. All right. Lots, lots of goodies there. I really like this guy. It's very articulate. So a couple of problems for post-tribbers is, and, and some mid-tribbers, is the concept that we're in heaven. And pre-rathers can wrap their head around a little bit more what they believe is after the abomination of desolation, that Jesus Christ could, his arrival could be imminent as in to capture or to rapture the church up to heaven for three and a half years. So that's the difference between pre-trib and mid-trib. Mid-tribbers will believe that it's, it's the halfway point, that that's where imminency begins. Whereas with pre-tribbers, we just believe that Jesus can come at any time and snatch us away to heaven while the Antichrist gets unveil unveiled by the Holy Spirit and then the seven-year tribulation commences. Because when you read the book of Revelations, there is judgment coming upon the earth starting with the very first seal, which is the Antichrist being revealed. That's the beginning. That's how we know it's the beginning. And then it progresses through the rest of the seals. And then we get the rest of the trumpets and then the rest of the, the bowls of wrath. So it's, it, again, it's very simple when you lay it out that way, it gets confusing for mid tribbers and, and uh, post tribbers. Let's just jump back in. Why do you think people get, and we've talked about this, you and I a lot, but so worked up about this issue? I mean, it really gets people, when you talk about theology, really upset having this discussion. Mm -hmm. I think two reasons. One is just the fact that people say, well, it's just a convenient escape clause. You guys just don't want to go through any pain, so you create a, a doctrine that kind of gets you out of the hard times. 
Um, but I, I would say that if that were true, then certainly the ark was an escape clause from God's apocalyptic wrath. Uh, certainly the mm -hmm. angels taking Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he delivers his judgment was certainly an escape clause. So yeah, there is an escape from God's wrath, not from man's wrath, but from God's wrath. And, you know, Romans 8, 1 tells us that there's no condemnation left for us in Christ Jesus. So the idea right. that God would punish his children with the same anger and fury that he's going to unleash on planet earth uh, to me is unthinkable. And the other thing is that people say, well, a pre-tribulational rapture is kind of the lazy man's approach to uh, the end times. It's kind of like you just expect Jesus to take you out and so you don't have to do anything. But the way I would answer that is to say that a pre-tribulational wrath is really the, uh, excuse me, the pre-tribulational rapture is really the only view that allows for Christ to come back at any time. Uh, when you get into the other views, you kind of like know when he's going to come back. So conceivably, you could sort of be spiritually lazy before that and then just get your life together right before Christ is about to come back. But in the pre-tribulational view, we believe Christ could come back at any time. And of course, this is a view that's been held ever since the early church, I, I list in my book, Wake the Bride, about 23 scriptures in the New Testament that talks about that expectant hope that the early church had of him coming back at any time. And of course, the, the early church uh, apostles taught it. There, there's uh, extra biblical documents like the Didache, which is the teaching of the 12 apostles that refer to the imminent return of Christ. And also the early church fathers as well held this view. Interesting, because when you think about this logically, the idea that Jesus died for us on the cross and he saved us from the wrath to come. Post-tribbers, and again, it's going to feel like I'm attacking post-tribbers, but I, I've watched a ton of videos, especially by Joel Richardson, where basically they're like, they will say things like Noah's Ark, that was not an escape from earth. That was not a rapture. That was Noah going through the flood. I've heard Andrew Farley say this. He would say silly things like, you want to be left behind. You don't want to be taken. Like just weird stuff, right? But again, it's based on the idea that people don't have an understanding of the difference between God's wrath and persecution by men and causing tribulations on earth, people causing tribulations. Like we, for some reason, post-tribbers have a tough time trying to figure that out. They go, well, wrath means something else. It's it's not God's wrath on earth. It's It's hell. They'll say stuff like that. They'll say wrath is actually God. Jesus saves us from hell. He's not talking about the seven-year tribulation because we have to endure to the end. That's what we have to do. So they'll use this and then they'll ignore what happened with Lot when Lot was drugged out of Sodom and Gomorrah. They'll say, no, no, no. Did you notice that Lot didn't get raptured? So there's no rapture. What you're doing, Shane, is you're inferring that God rescues people from his judgment. You're inferring that. You're inferring that in Noah's Ark. I'm telling you what the story was historically that God, that God protected Noah from his judgment upon all the earth. So his entire house went into the ark and they were saved from the wrath of God, which destroyed the whole earth. Animals, people, buildings, everything got destroyed and they were lifted up above the earth. In fact, 30 cubits above the highest mountain. One of the angels that drug Lot out said, I can't destroy this place until you're out of here because Abraham interceded and said to God, will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? And God said, no, if I find 50, I'm not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. 
fact, he didn't destroy it until four people were removed. He could have protected them, but he didn't protect them in the city. He removed them. That's the template that we follow, that Jesus Christ removes his body from the earth so that he can unleash his wrath on mankind. And we see this in the book of Revelation. It's very bad. It's very bad. You can't avoid it. So let's go back to the video. I say you can't avoid how obvious as to how bad things are going to unfold on the earth. So let's continue. Well, yeah, and you brought up a number of really interesting things there. The Bible does recount other times, right, where people were were believers and righteous people like Noah were removed, right, from God's wrath. They were not, they did not fall prey to it. They were able to escape it. And so there there are examples of that. And I know one thing that you've often hit, um, or you've encountered rather, is people who will say, Well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. And the concept itself. You know, they'll challenge that it wasn't ingrained in the early church, although, as you mentioned, you have evidence that you believe it was. But how do you respond to those who will who will sort of pick and say, well, the word wasn't there, therefore, how could the concept have been? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's a really fair question. Um, usually I counter by immediately saying, well, there are a lot of words that we use to describe biblical doctrines that are nowhere found in Scripture. Uh, things like the Great Commission, mm -hmm. Incarnation of Christ, uh, the Trinity, Easter, Christmas, missions, even the word Bible is not even in the Bible. And uh, in fact, no English words are in the original uh, manuscripts. So the question really is, what does the Bible teach about this belief called the rapture? And when you go to somewhere like... That's interesting <laughs> how Jeff says that Eng there are no English words in the original scriptures. Like if you think about Hebrew, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, if you think about the New Testament written in Greek, there were no English words. So it's kind of a weird thing to say rapture is not in the Bible or Trinity is not in the Bible. But when you think about it, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but we know what we're talking about. When we talk about the rapture, we know what we're talking about. Again, all three camps believe there's a rapture. So right out of the gate, we're all on the same page that we know that our feet are going to lift the ground one day. It's just the timing that we're all, this is what we wrestle through is the timing of it. And I believe it's before the tribulation. And somehow that is counted as satanic. That's a satanic stronghold. Um, it's cultic in nature. It's like the Mormons. Like it, it's weird that, People will jump on that and say this is the most dangerous doctrine that you can believe when, when you think about it, you're actually preparing your heart every single day for Jesus' return. And you edify the church, you read his word, you study, you pray, you go to church, you go to Bible studies, and you just you wait while you're working. That's all it is. And I don't understand how that could be the most dangerous doctrine on the planet it's weird it actually seems like it's the most christian doctrine and it's the most it's the easiest and simplest to understand let's continue like first thessalonians chapter 4 you encounter this word that that we get our word rapture from it's the greek word harpazo uh, which means to to suddenly and violently snatch someone away from somewhere and it's used all throughout the new testament uh, paul when he talked about being caught up into heaven the third heaven in second corinthians 12 that's the same word harpazo you say well then where does rapture come from well when the catholic church was translating the bible from the original greek into latin they translated this word harpazo into the latin word uh the, the verb rapier and uh, that came to be a version of that came to be rapturo 
uh, which is transliterated into English as rapture. So it's really kind of, to be honest, Billy, it doesn't really matter what we call it. I mean, it's popularly known as the rapture. Uh, we could call it the harpazzo, but that sounds more like an Italian dish at a restaurant somewhere, you know, or, <laughs> or, we, or we could call it the great snatching away, but that sounds like a zombie movie or whatever. So it, the rapture's kind of stuck. Uh, but in fact, the scripture does give it some other names. It's called the blessed, blessed hope. It's called the appearing uh, Paul uses another Greek word, parousia, which simply means the arrival or the appearing of the Lord. And uh, so there are other words we can use. It's just that rapture is kind of the popular one that's uh, sort of taken hold. I hope, if if nothing else, I hope you get the relaxed nature of Jen, Jeff Kinley and, and the, the hope that we have as Christians that Jesus is coming back one day. This isn't a dangerous doctrine to believe. This is something that we're looking for with eagerness, with expectation that one day we're going to be with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And we see this in Revelation where the six seals open up and you see a group of people in heaven that are worshiping Jesus Christ with bodies in heaven 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's us. That's Christians. That's what we do. If we could worship Jesus 24 hours a day without our jobs, we would do that because we love Jesus Christ that much. This is why you get church services all over the world worshiping Jesus Christ. It's all over the place. This is what we love to do. We love to worship Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking forward to in heaven, is worshiping him. There's nothing better. Like, it's fantastic. And this is the comfort that Paul was giving the Thessalonians and all the believers that he interacted with, that, look, guys, we have comfort. We're not to mourn like those that have loss. One day we're going to see our loved ones that have died in Christ. And Jesus is going to bring them back from heaven and we're going to be caught up in the air to meet them in the air and we're going to be with him forever. Like it's beautiful and it's so refreshing to actually hear someone just articulate it so nicely. And and as a Christian, you, you got to look at this from a perspective of, look, we have hope. And while we're waiting, we're diving into his word to get to know him a little bit more each and every single day. And we edify each other. We put other people above us, before us. We edify the church. We build each other up. We encourage one another. So let's go back to the video. And to your point, there are plenty of other words that are, you know, we use today to describe concepts that are in scripture, but these words themselves are not, are not in the Bible. Yeah. Why do you think there's been um, such a debate around this, right? You've got the mid-trib, which seems like the smaller percentage of people. Then you've got the post-trib, which that seems to be the one where there's the most debate going on. Um, what do you make of those perspectives and why do you think there's been so much debate around this in the church? Yeah, I think part of it comes down to a person's hermeneutic or their approach to how they interpret the scripture. I mean, uh, however you begin is how you're going to end. In other words, how you choose to interpret the Bible is going to lead you to a certain interpretive destination, if you will. And so when you take scripture from uh, what I see as a, a historical, grammatical, literal context and just read the Bible in its plain sense, then I think it leads you to a pre-tribulational rapture. Uh, when you get into uh, views like the mid-trib, which is basically saying that the, the rapture is going to happen basically when the Antichrist begins his serious work on the earth and enters the temple and commits the abomination and desolation, things get really bad. Um, they say, well, that, that's when Christ is coming back. Uh, there are some other views like the pre-wrath view, which says he comes back about five-sixths of the way into the tribulation. But for me, Billy, I, I look at the approach to Scripture, and when I see in Revelation chapter 6, it says that the Lamb of God is the one that's unleashing all these judgments on the earth at the beginning 
of the tribulation. And in fact, the whole earth, it says at the end of chapter six, recognizes that all these judgments are from him who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And so that's one of the reasons why I see that the the, the pre-trib rapture really fits the just the, the natural flow and the reading of the book of Revelation. But yes, there are other views. And, you know, I always make it clear to other people that, you know, I'm not going to break fellowship with someone just because they hold a different view. That's fine. Uh, but I think a serious uh, look at the scriptures, it will come to a conclusion that the pre-trib rapture has the most support for it. Yeah, it's not a salvation issue. That's sort of been the right. term that, you know, I know we've talked about in the past that, you know, for a lot of people, they'll say, okay, it's not a salvation. It's an important issue. It's And there's a reason we understand prophecy and we seek to, I mean, the same thing happens with the issue of evil, which is something that you and I have talked about a lot as well. You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about evil you know, in the church. It's like, well, right. this exists. It's a huge part of scripture and it actually helps you understand goodness. When you understand evil, you know, understanding prophecy helps you understand, I mean, how much of scripture is prophecy, an insane amount of it, uh, much yeah. of it, you know, telling us that Jesus was going to come as well, right? So in the first place, the first coming. So yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot here, but, but that actually reminds me because we're only going to be in this series covering, you know, pre, mid and post. You mentioned there are some other views. There's also the partial rapture view, which is really, which is really interesting. What what do you make of that view? Yeah, and I encounter people who hold this view sometimes, and basically they say that only some Christians are going to go up in the rapture. Uh, and it's not so much a matter of the timing, but a matter of really who's a part of this thing. And they sort of make two categories of Christians where if you're really walking with Christ, you know, kind of who can know who's walking with Christ enough to be taken uh, in the rapture. Uh, but when I read 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Billy, it says that we shall all be changed at the raptures. And of course, Paul's writing to the most carnally minded church in the whole New Testament. So if anybody's not going to be raptured in a partial rapture, it's going to be the Corinthians, right? But um, but Paul says we're all going to be changed. And and of course, there are. I don't think there's really any other scriptures that would support uh, a partial rapture. I mean, Christ is coming back for not just part of his bride, but for his whole bride. Okay, so before we go, one, and this was like, this is a great lesson on this, because I think people are seeking to understand, and you gave so many scripture references that people can go back to, to read for themselves and understand. We also have an end times guide over on PureFlix that people can download um, for free. Go to offers.pureflix.com and check that out. Um, but the Antichrist. So where does the Antichrist, and this is sort of a loaded question, you know, so feel free to take as much time as you need, but where does the Antichrist fit in with all of, of what we've talked about today? Yeah, well, Antichrist is the most talked about end times figure other than Jesus Christ himself. In fact, there are other, over a hundred different passages in the Bible that reference Antichrist. Uh, he's known by many names, the beast, the Antichrist, all that type of thing. But here's the deal. Basically, Satan has long wanted to be worshipped and to rule the world. It's been his ambition ever since the beginning of sin itself. And we read about that in, in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, about Satan's fall. But the, this whole time period, Billy, of the tribulation is going to be Satan's fulfillment of that long-held desire. And he's going to do that through a man uh, called Antichrist. I believe he will energize and fully possess this man. And he's going to be the one world global leader in the last days. Of course, our, all of our, our world right now is really converging towards that point. We're really kind of ramping up and grooming planet Earth for that, uh, that arrival. In fact, with this whole COVID chaos that's been going on, uh, there have been renewed calls for a one world government, a global governance system uh, that we need one man to lead uh, this type of thing. So this is not sci-fi or kind of out there thinking. It's right there in scripture and it's happening right now around us. Uh, I believe the Antichrist will appear on the scene after the rapture, that we won't know who the Antichrist is until that time. But scripture says he's going to lead a 10 nation coalition that's basically going to be that one world government that's going to bring a sense of peace and safety to the world in a post a rapture chaos uh, and, and the catastrophic uh, judgments that are happening. Uh, but uh, he's going to turn on humanity and require the mark of the beast. Uh, we've talked about that in the past. Uh, and then basically he's going to reign throughout that time, admit a lot of turmoil, a lot of judgment. Uh, and at the end of, of time, he's going to basically challenge Jesus to a, a duel. And uh, that's when Christ is going to come back uh, from the heavens and he's going to slay his enemies and cast the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. So it's really the culmination of human history, and the Antichrist plays a huge role in that. 
So that was a beautiful summary. And, you know, there's there's so much here. And I so appreciate you coming on to talk about the pre-trib rapture today and some of the other elements surrounding it. Where can people go to get your books? Because this is something that you write a lot on. You've done such an amazing job through your books on it. Where can they go? Yeah, you can just go to Amazon.com and just type in Jeff Kinley. I tell people, don't don't do Jeff Kinney. He's the diary of a wimpy kid guy. You know, you'll get a whole other set of books on that one. But Jeff Kinley uh, on Amazon, go to JeffKinley.com as well, and you can see some of the books as well. You'll get very confused theology on, on that one if you go in looking for end times in, the, in those books. Well, awesome. Thank you so right. much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, Billy. Anytime. All right. So that's, uh, I'm probably going to end it here. I was going to go into the mid trip, but that one is another 20 minutes. So I don't want to make this like an hour long video. Um, so this will be like pre trib. And then what I'll do is I will do another video with uh, the same guy interviewing someone else. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Billy Hollowell. He actually interviews a um, mid-tribber. So that'll be interesting. So I'm going to do that in another video. But I find it interesting that when you just simply read the scripture and you understand what Jesus Christ has done for us, that this was something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. People didn't know about the fact that we are going to be joint heirs, the Gentiles are joint heirs of Christ. That was not revealed in the Old Testament. This was revealed to Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle tells us that we are seated in heavenly places and one day we will be judging angels, which is kind of interesting. So, so in order for that to happen, we have to be in heaven, logically, to be trained by Jesus Christ in heaven for seven years, so that when we do come down to earth during the battle of Armageddon, we will know what to do. It's way more confusing to think about the idea that <clears throat> Jesus is coming by himself, and we are raptured upwards after the seven bowls of wrath, and over half the population, there's probably not going to be very many people left on the earth. There's probably not going to be very many buildings left on earth, animals, all kinds of vegetation destroyed, decimated, that we go up and down right away like a nice little u-turn and we're just going to know what to do right away when we're battling the antichrist and the false prophet and all the nations that are coming against israel at that time like it, it like logically that that doesn't make sense to go up and down it doesn't so it, it makes more sense to be in heaven Again, we see this in the book of Revelation where there are people before the throne worshiping and it doesn't say we're martyrs. I'm not saying that there isn't martyrs today, but it, those don't look like tribulation saints because they're on earth. And there's another pocket of people that are asking, when is God going to avenge us? There's a pocket of people and who do those remind you of? Well, those are <clears throat> most likely those are the people that lived during biblical times, including any of the Is Israelites, if you will, because they're wanting to be avenged and they're wanting Jacob's trouble to be over with. And a voice says, it'll be done shortly. You just have to wait a little bit longer so that your brothers will be slayed the same way that you were. We don't talk like that as Christians. We're not waiting. We're not demanding God to avenge us. We don't have a piece of real estate. 
we never received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. We never entered into a covenant. We were outside looking in. So these this group of people, I believe, are Israelites that are asking God how much longer before this Jacob's trouble is over. And God says, be patient because it's it's going to come to pass shortly. Like you don't have much longer and they are given white robes. The other pocket of people have white robes already on them. And they're worshiping. And then the elder, the angel asked John, who are these people? They came out of the great tribulation. So that's it for this video. If you like this video, feel free to give a thumbs up if you like this format. And then also let me know what your thoughts are as well. Uh, post your comments. Try not to make them too long because if I get hundreds of comments, if you're just copying and pasting scripture verses, I have a Bible. I read this Bible. So I don't mind scripture verses, but have a thought. Use your head a little bit and then articulate what you're trying to tell me or what you're trying to teach me. Because if you just say something like read Matthew 24, like really that that helps everyone out? That 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 helps everyone. Why not just share a thought? Put it in a paragraph or two. Don't copy and paste from a website and post it on every single video of mine because I will remove the comment. If you're copy and pasting the same thing over and over again, I will remove it. But I don't mind if you quote a scripture verse and you say, what about this? That's fine. That's that's perfect. I like the interaction. And then also at the end of it, just put where you're from. Because I, I again, I, I see people from Venezuela, from South Korea, from different parts of the United States, from Ukraine, from all over the place. There are people watching this video, watching this channel, from South Africa, from Australia. So make sure and let me know where you're watching from. Thanks again, and I will see you in another video. Bye for now.